Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Science and Engineering Practice 6. It's on constructing explanations and designing solutions. And so the big theme that this practice is about is about theories. Because theories are used in science to construct explanations for how the world works, how the universe and phenomena in it operate. And it's also used in engineering to design and test solutions. And those, so theories are incredibly important, but we should talk about what a theory is. Because if you say, I've got a theory on who stole my sandwich out of the refrigerator, that's just a guess. It's not a theory. How are theories created? Well, let's look through a flow chart. First of all, you come up with an idea. And so maybe we're looking at the phenomena of infectious disease, how disease is transmitted from one person to another. Scientists came up with ideas to explain that. You then perform an experiment, and if the evidence supports the idea, you can move on. But if it doesn't support the idea, no, then you've got a bad idea. So you've got to go back again, and we have to start all over. So I have to come up with an idea, design an experiment, test my theory. If it doesn't fit, got a bad idea and I start over again. But if it does fit, eventually I can come up with a theory. And that theory is used to explain phenomena in the universe. It's awesome. But it's developed over a long period of time by scientists and lots of experiments. But we're not done yet. What do you do next? Well, you discover new evidence. And if that evidence can be used to modify our theory to explain the new evidence, then we improve the theory and we have a better theory and so the theory gets better and better and better over time. So we've got this feedback loop. But occasionally we'll come up with new evidence that can't modify our theory and so we have something called a scientific revolution. So we have to start over again and we have to come up with a brand new idea. And so theories are big things in science. They've been developed over years and years and years. Let me give you an example of one. The Big Bang Theory uh, was first proposed by Georges Lemaire. Uh, and he was a priest, but also an astrophysicist, an astronomer, and he came with this idea of the Big Bang Theory, that the universe is like a giant loaf of bread that all began at one point and has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And so we're sitting within this loaf of bread, and we continue to move apart from everything in the universe. Um, seems like a crazy idea. Well, evidence started to pile up. Some of the evidence from Edwin Hubble, who was looking into space using a telescope and found that the light everywhere in the universe was shifted to the red. What does that mean? It means that everything in the universe is moving away from us. And if everything is moving away from us, then we could play the time backwards and we get back to a point where the singularity, where everything began. And so evidence has piled up over year after years after years, and we've come up with this Big Bang Theory. Or maybe the theory of natural selection, which is sometimes confused. It simply is an explanation for how species evolve. And so right here, there are two moths. There's a dark peppered moth and a light peppered moth. And you might say, well, wow, this one blends in perfectly wonderful camouflage. Well, scientists tried to come up with an idea of how they could evolve to a climate. Some people thought they just were created that way. One of the first ideas was the idea somehow um, proposed by Lamarck that, that they can somehow will themselves to change. So for example, a giraffe got a long neck by stretching up to get reach leaves higher in a tree. Um, they didn't understand how, how uh, genetics worked and how information was passed from generation to generation. And eventually Charles Darwin came up with this theory of natural selection, that you have variation in a population. So you have uh, moths that are dark and moths that are light. And then the ones that don't fit in are selected. In other words, they're eaten by birds. And so over time, species are going to start to adapt to their local climate. So there was argument about this. And over the next 50 years, it became established as the scientific theory. And we really haven't changed it much. Uh, since the time of Darwin to explain how evolution occurs. Let me give you another one you maybe never heard of. It's called the miasma theory. This was a theory that explained infectious disease. The idea went like this, that organic material, when it dies, gives off this bad air or this miasma that moves through. So this is an explanation for how typhoid fever uh, would spread throughout people. And this is a book on the prevention against bad air. Well, science didn't stack up to support the miasma theory, and so it was thrown out and replaced by the germ theory. Scientists like Louis Pasteur, and this is his Pasteur flask, started to study, well, how does something go bad? How does something spoil? And at this time, we were also using microscopes to look at microscopic life. And so eventually, we came up with this germ theory that bacteria and viruses are passed from one organism to another that cause disease. And evidence started to pile up, and now we have the germ theory. Um, but it could eventually be replaced by something else. And so when we're talking about a theory, it's well established. Well, in a science classroom, then, what is a hypothesis? 
It's not a scientific theory. And it's not, like a lot of teachers will say, it's not an educated guess. Um, what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a possible, excuse me, a plausible explanation for what we're seeing or our observations. And so it's not just a wild guess. It's an explanation of what we think is going on. And this works best through analogy. So basically we sit here with all of these scientific theories and then we make new observations. And those observations, we can bridge the gap between theories and observations using explanations or using hypotheses or hypothesis testing. Now in engineering, it's a little bit different. They also come up with guesses and explanations, but they use that as a part of what's called the cycle of design. So basically you start by planning. So you come up with a problem or a human need that we have to fulfill. You then design a solution to that. You create the solution and then you evaluate it. And then after you've evaluated it, then we may improve upon it, a new design, a better design. We create that, test it, and then we do that same thing over and over again. So there still is this idea of me explaining what happened, what went wrong, what went right. Here's an example. So this is the first Apple computer. Uh, basically, it just shipped you the motherboard and you had to build everything around the outside of it. That was improved by the Apple II. That was my first computer. And then the Macintosh, the iMac, and now the iMac that we have today was created through design and the cycle of design getting better and better and better over time. But it starts with an explanation of first define the problem, what do we have to solve, and then let's solve it. And so the goal in science education is to have our students constructing explanations and then designing solutions. And so what's a nice progression for that? In other words, if we think of the analogy of a bullseye, we want our students from day one in elementary school throwing darts at this board constructing explanations and then over the years we want them to get better and better and better and better closer to the bullseye and so the framework suggests owl pellets is a good way to get started in elementary so basically you order these owl pellets these are from a long-eared owl students break it apart they get the bones out of it they use a sheet to figure out what rodents are in there and then they're trying to construct an explanation so what are they trying to come up with what do these owls eat? What does their diet consist of? And you want students making guesses really early in their education. Or we could give them uh, plant growth, for example. So students could be growing plants in school. They could make guesses as to what could increase plant growth. So they might come up with the idea of uh, sunlight. So they need a certain amount of light. And so you could increase the amount of light and see how that affects plants. But maybe you don't water them and they die as a result of that. Well, now this is a new explanation, so we have to get better and better and better. You want students making guesses, and you can do that individually or as a class. Um, as we move into middle school, the problems can be harder, but the explanations are, are, are very important. So in an example, this is one I ask my students all the time, why does boiling water bubble? Like, where are the bubbles coming from? And a really common guess is that it's hydrogen and oxygen gas because we know that there's H2O. That'd be scary if you had hydrogen and oxygen gas coming out of boiling water because they're both, I mean, it's hugely explosive. So it's not that. So you want them making guesses and then modifying those guesses to fit with established theories that we have. It's also important that they start designing solutions. And so you can do this in elementary, like bridge building are great competitions that you can do where we can test out different designs. And that can move all the way up through high school in big designs. Like this is a solar car competition. And obviously you can't do that in a classroom, but it's something that your school should be working on. Uh, and we could do this, like this is something I do in my class. We do water quality testing where we're looking at the quality of the water and the creek that just goes right outside of our school. But we can also build upon that. How can we make it cleaner? How we can build up the, or how can we clean up the water in this creek? And so um, designing solutions are important. We want students doing it from day one, but the sky is the limit. Uh, in high school, we can do incredible projects. We can make the world a better place and I hope that's helpful.